This is a place where we pray. This is a place where we cry. This is a place where we start till death do us part. Where we say goodbye. Here we leave all our pain. Find forgiveness and grace. Here we walk down the aisle. Dedicate every child here in this sacred today and for the ones who are uh, excuse me, watching online. Um, I see a lot of visitors here. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Alicia. I'm in the children's ministry director here at Mountain Tabor and today we have a day of celebration and acknowledgement. Today we have these three families um, who the parents have decided to come and make a declaration to the Lord and to um, just really give thanks to him and dedicate their lives to raising their children, their sons, all of them sons, um, in the Lord's way. Um, that song was just amazing that we can come to a sacred place and be able to pray, to dedicate every child, to have so many things done in this one place. So I'd like to open us up in a prayer. So um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come here today. Thank you for sending us a child, the one who would die on the cross for our sins and who loves us unconditionally. We pray for the many blessings that you have given to us, and we are so thankful for this time. Be with us today as we worship you, and be with Pastor Philip as he brings the message that all 
glory be given to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's always an exciting time when a new child comes into a family. Um, today, <laughs> we get to acknowledge the precious gifts these, these, that God has given to these families. And in this joyful moment, I have the opportunity to sharing how these parents can express their full appreciation to God through baby dedication. Although they're not all babies, <laughs> there's a lot of different ages. Um, in Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and to give you a future. Dedicating a child acknowledges God's sovereignty over the child. It's not a salvation experience or it's not a church membership. It's simply a baby dedication is when parents present their child to God and before God in front of his people for the grace and wisdom and carrying out their responsibilities. Parents also pray that their child might one day accept Christ as Lord and Savior and for, for the forgiveness he gives us of our sins, especially an eternal life. So um, I know that I've gotten the chance to know all these children, but I want to introduce you to all these children. So first, we'll have Mr. Henry come up. It's okay. You can go play with the trucks. His favorite word, by the way, is truck. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so this is Henry James Anderson, and he was born on August 7, 2019. And these are his parents, Brian and Katie Anderson. And we are so thankful they're part of this church and getting to know Henry and his love of trucks. <laughs> so <laughs> we present the certificate of dedication. <laughs> yeah, tr can you say it for everyone? Truck. Truck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have y'all slide in. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'd like to welcome our second child, Mr. Gabriel. Always has cool. Um, Jackets. He had a Paw Patrol earlier. That's so cool. <laughs> he loves. This is Gabriel Cutler. He was born June 8, 2017. And this is his mom, Brittany. His father, Nathan, is actually on drill right now. Is it a drill that you said? Um, he serves in our military, so we're very thankful for that. And we're very thankful for this family coming to our church because we've gotten to know them. And sweet Gabriel, who's a little shy, but he's not shy at all. <laughs> he is a sweet little boy. You want to hold your certificate? <laughs> and I'd like to introduce our newest. <laughs> this is Creighton Brent Taylor. Creighton was just born in October on the 15th of 2020 and his parents are Christopher and and he's so cute in his little outfit. <laughs> you did smile. Good boy. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Good. I'm going to give this to you. All right. So the Lord has given this uh, responsibility to, these, uh, to the parents for these children. Um, these children did not choose to be um, have you as parents. God gave them to you. And these children cannot care for themselves. God gave them to you to do that. Um, in Proverbs 22, 6, it states, Train up a child in the way he should go. And he is, when he is old, he will not depart from it. It will be up to you as the parent in God's ways and also to help them and lead them to know that the Lord is their Christ and Savior. So we are going to do a couple of declarations, and I've asked them to repeat. We do if they agree. So parents, by coming forward before God and his, and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to dedicate yourselves and your child to the Lord? If you, if you agree, <laughs> reply, we do. We do, good. Having come freely, I ask you now that you enter into the following commitment 
in the presence of God and his people so that your child may walk into the abundant life that Christ offers. Do you parents vow by God's help to provide your child a Christian home of love and peace, to raise him in the truth of the Lord's instructions and discipline, and to encourage them to one day trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior? If so, please respond, we do. Okay. So, I come to you, Mountain Tabor, as a church. We, as Christian believers, are able to help these parents. By modeling this kind of love, it cannot be done alone. It requires the help of others. For this reason, parents call upon the help of the church family. I now direct my question to you. By helping here before God and his people, do you hereby declare your desire to help these parents fulfill the vow that they have just made by becoming the children's faith family? If you if you would please respond, we do, if you agree. Thank you. <laughs> so as a church, we have gifted each child a Bible and a small book. I'm going to give this to you. <laughs> These are Bibles and books to um, kind of be a, well, <laughs> a remembrance of this day and that the parents can read to their children and it talks about the many blessings that God has given us. So if we would go in prayer so we can pray for these families and over these children. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing these families to come up here and these parents to declare their love, their thankfulness to you for these precious gifts given. We pray for Nathan, for Brittany, for Bri, for Katie, for Christopher, for Lindsay, that they seek you, Lord in those challenging times, and also for the many blessings that you will still give and keep giving their families. We pray for these young boys, Creighton, Henry, Gabriel, that they will come to know you, Lord, to accept you into their hearts and become believers in Christ. We pray for their future. We pray for all of our church family, our, our family and our friends here today. We pray that the encouragement and the advice and we pray that these families come to us and seek, seek anything they might need. We pray for these parents as they raise their children in the Lord's ways. And we are so blessed to have them here as a, members of Mount Tabor Baptist Church. Thank you for everything you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's all stand and uh, con continue our worship time together. Let's sing.
you never stop working even when I don't see it you working even when I don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working way make a miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are oh, way make come to you this morning and I watch these men come to the altar to communicate with you I just thank you for these men men that look to you for the decisions that are being made in this church deacons men of faith I thank you for them Lord I thank you for our pastor I thank you for Daniel Lord, as far as the pastor today, I pray as he preaches to us that it touches a heart out there, that that heart that will bring someone to the altar to accept you as their Savior. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the music makers in this church that helps us, leads us in worship. Lord, I thank you for the youth thank you for these young boys that are dedicated today Lord I pray as they grow and eventually one day go out in this world I pray they carry Jesus in their heart and Lord I thank you for this church I thank you for giving us a place to come worship even through the darkest times this past year that we were here are leading us. And I thank you, Lord. Lord, I want to pray this morning for Steve Sears. Lord, as he's be taking chemo again, Lord, I pray you keep him well. Uh, Lord, I, we, we pray for a healing. We just ask you, Lord, if you'll help Steve, if it be your will, that you heal him. Lord, I pray for all the other sick and our congregation and Lord I pray for our country I pray for this president I, I pray for this Congress and Supreme Court I pray Lord these leaders look to you I pray this truly be a one nation under God and Lord I, I thank you for placing us in this country the greatest country on earth but it's full of problems Lord and you, you're aware I, I pray we turn to you Lord, I again thank you for our many blessings. I thank you for the lives that you give all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. 
Family Relationships, the title of this message. I want to encourage you from God's Word. I realize that many folks get their advice for raising kids from many, many places. I remember my mom read a book called uh, something about Dr. Spock. I thought he was a Star Wars character or maybe a Star Trek Generation character, but he wasn't. And my mom looked at that book to help raise me. I was a problem kid. You can understand. She needed a lot of resources to help her. But I want to encourage these parents this morning and these grandparents and these family friends that there's only one place that we get the right truth about raising kids, and it's God's Word. It was good for all the kids that have gone before us. It'll be good for the kids that come after us, and it's good for the kids today. I want to tell you something. The Word of God speaks to family relationships. As a matter of fact, in this church, we have a doctrinal statement, which means uh, that this is what we believe about families, and I want to take a moment to read it to you, these core values, and, and I quote, God has ordained the family as the foundational institution of human society. It is composed of persons related to one another by marriage, blood, or adoption. Children, from the moment of conception, that tells you something about the value of life, doesn't it? May I say this to you? Parents are to demonstrate to their children God's pattern for marriage. Parents are to teach their children spiritual, moral values and to lead them through consistent lifestyle example and loving discipline to make choices based on biblical truth. Children are to honor and obey their parents. God has given us this truth to teach us, to lead us, to transform our family relationships. Let's ask his blessing upon his word. Father, our Father, you who are perfect in all things, you've created the world and all that it contains. There's not a person that's ever came into this world without your full knowledge of being placed in their mother's womb, gifted by a glorious God to live out life with your help and as a gift from God. So, Lord, we pray you'd bless these families as they move forward. And I pray across this land that we might look and value children again. We need your help, Lord, in the legislator, that we might again see children as the Bible says they are, valuable. That they might be preserved, even as you preserved Moses. And that they might be obedient to the authority that you've placed over them. Yourself, their parents. That in the days ahead, Lord, that they would honor their parents as they come near the final days of their life. We pray that your Bible might govern and dictate to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand in honor of God's word? Our text for the morning is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, mainly but I added verse 4 because I think it's a section that goes together. Hear God's word. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But bring them up. And the discipline and instruction of the Lord. May God bless his word. Would you please be seated? First of all, in order to look at this text, you must look back to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and it says this. Submit to one another out of reverence with God. So you've got to understand when you look at these family relationships, the relationships of the children with their parents and the parents with their children, even when you look past this text and you see the relationship of slaves and their owners, there's a submission that governs everything. Uh, submission. And here in this text, children are submit to parents in the Lord. Now, may I clarify? Uh, we live in a day where everybody has an opinion. And most people think their opinion is as valuable as anything out there. I was recently wanting, I went to the baseball coach, not really, but I wanted to go to him. 
And wanted to say, would you let me lecture the people for just a few minutes before the game starts so that I might tell them who's in charge in the game? And then I would tell them this. First of all, the umpire's in charge. Whatever call he makes, whether you agree with it or not, that's the call we go by. Secondly, the coach is in charge of the players. I wanted to tell them because I think we've forgotten who's in charge. I think we've forgotten who's in authority in our lives. And I want to say to the children, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, and then parents, I want to say this to you. It's their responsibility to obey you. This idea, Jeremy used to say this way. He'd say this to me. He'd say, you know, the calves are running the, the cow. And we got a lot of country. I didn't know what he meant. I said, what do you mean the, the calves are running the cow? He said, well, the children are running the parents today. Is that true? No. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. It ain't true with that child. I tell you, that's a good answer. From a birthday girl, I like that. But I want to report to you, it's sad to say that often it is the case. It's often the case that kids are setting the truth for their life. And parents are merely responding to them. I never will forget I was in uh, middle school. That was a good uh, answer, Ada Grace. I love you. I was Sawyer. Sawyer. Woo-woo. And may I say this to you just along the way. The day that we don't have children and people moving in the church, we might have a dead church. We ought to have people that can say amen and talk and they can go to the bathroom if they need to go to the bathroom or can take their kids out. Who cares? I pray that Mount Tabor might be the most moving, grooving church in the days ahead because we understand that we worship a God who's over all and that we believe what the book says. Children, obey your parents. There ought not be nothing to add to that. I never forget I was in sixth or seventh grade. I don't remember which, and I... I'm ashamed to tell some of these stories, but they're true. And I asked my parents not to watch today, but um, I never forget this one incident. I was in the sixth or seventh grade. I think I'd been in a fight in the lunchroom, and the principal was sort of my buddy. I, I mean, he and I were sort of friends, and I was in there talking to him, telling him why this other fellow needed to be beaten on, and that he was trouble, and he was a smart aleck, and he picked on people bigger than he was, and, and man, he was eating it up. I think he was just in enjoy the entertainment of his story. But true story. Donnie, I looked out the window because this principal had a big office with windows that looked over the parking lot. And here comes my daddy, Clarence Blankenship, PTA president, <laughs> coming toward the office. I looked at David Vickery. I said, Mr. Vickery, I said, something bad's happening. I see my daddy coming up the parking lot. I said, I said he's going to kill me. And he turned around, he saw him, he grinned at me. He said, get on back to class, me and you will talk about it later. Now I'm telling you something, as a rebellious seventh grader or sixth grader, whatever I was, I remember thinking, buddy, you must not care about me because you're going to shield me from what I deserve to be into. May I say that when you begin to take the truth and know what needs to be done and change it to fit what you feel, or what you like, you don't care for that child, you don't care for any child, you're more concerned about the smiling and the laughing than you are of the gift that God's given you. When you don't follow the truth, you're in trouble, period. Or maybe you could think about it this way. License to do what, wrong, what is wrong is not love, <laughs> Love does what is right. And I'll tell you one thing. We need some parents that'll do what's right. That'll believe what God's Word says and live it out in their home, whether the kids like it or not. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with celebrating children and who they are and their gifts. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's a time to stand for what's right in the Lord. There's an order to our lives. And when that order gets turned up, 
upside down in a country, in a church, in a home, you got trouble. Because God has ordered this universe and we have a responsibility to do what is right. When mom and dad uh, begin this family, we got to understand that children are a gift from God. Not everybody has children. Some of them don't have them biological, but they are adopt them or they foster them and and this is the same thing but they have a responsibility to govern these children because there's an order there's a rank that is under God now this text says it this way now a lot of times people don't like this I never forget I was doing a wedding in Virginia they said don't use that term wives submit to your husband listen friend that's not my term that's God's term (laughs) There's a rank in this text. And first is the, is the husband. Secondly is the wives. Thirdly is the children. There's an order to things. Now, I think with the, the husband and wife, there's a mutual subjection. I do that all the time. My wife says something. I do whatever she says. I love her. <laughs> now, I don't do it because the order's out of my family. I do it because I love her. There's a difference. It's not license. It's love. See, the Bible says that these children are a gift from God, and they've been entrusted to you parents. And I'll tell you something, you're going to be responsible for that. You're going to be held responsible for how you order your life at home. The Bible says it this way in Psalm 127, verse 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. As a matter of fact, you might even think about it this way in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, be fruitful and multiply. The Catholics are right about that, by the way. We need to be fruitful, and we need to take good care or have domain over this world that the Lord has created. Secondly, it says, Psalm 139, verse 16, You saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Children are a gift from God, and they're under this rank. Husbands, wives, and children are all under God's governance. And that's another thing you must understand. Men, when God says women submit to your husbands, that's not that we become God or we become central. God must remain central to all. And our submission ultimately is to Him under His Word. We've been placed by God and we have this honor. Now I want you to notice again, I I, I want to read these verses again, verse Because I want to point out something to you that that I want to highlight. That in my study, that I recognize this is right. Look at verses 1 through 3 again. Children, obey your parents. And and I want you to underline in your Bible this phrase. In the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. First of all, the very first of the Ten Commandments that's appointed to children is honor your father and mother. It's the only commandment that is directly to children. But I want to say something to you that's also become unpopular today, Sawyer. A lot of times we see it merely in the child part of the relationship that I'm to honor my mother and father. But I'm going to tell you something. When you get old, you're still to honor your father and your mother. See, this, this commandment is not just for a... 1 to 18 years old. Honoring your father and mother is a lifetime truth. It's an imperative. In this text, it's a command. But it, but it says to do it in the Lord. Obey your parents. And then this amplification of the imperative with a prepositional phrase, in the Lord. How do you obey your parents? You do it in the Lord. How do you, how do you get along with them when you don't agree with them? You do it because God says so. See, children begin to say, well, if God's made it that way, it's right. And I'm going to submit to the Lord on this, even if I disagree with my parents. It's got to be in the Lord. Now, I want to tell you something that all of you know. Now, I appreciate so much our children's director, Lisa. I thought she did a wonderful job. And could you tell something about her? She knows these kids. Truck, truck. My daughter says the same thing, truck, truck. But in that relationship, there's some trouble. In every family, 
in every home. Now, it's varying in degrees, but, but there's some trouble. So this phrase, obey your parents in the Lord, is a key phrase. And most people just go right over it. But see, it's an amplification of how you do it. Because parents, sin is a part of our lives. And most of us in here, maybe not all, have experienced as children mean-spirited words. We've been beaten harder than we should have been beaten. We've experienced some emotional pain as a child who could not deal with all that they were dealing with. Now, you can go through your life hiding this in your heart if you want to. Or you can obey your parents in the Lord. And you can realize that when God made your parents and when God made me a parent, that it didn't make a perfect parent. And that I made some mistakes. I remember the first time I had to apologize to my kids. It was a very humbling experience. I was telling my wife, is this right? And we children have experienced some things in our lives, some of us, that are difficult to deal with. We may have been in a situation where God's placed us in a womb that maybe we wouldn't have chosen. Maybe our mom and dad had some addiction problems. Or maybe they weren't there. Or maybe you've experienced all kinds of things. And I want to say something. Sin has come into the world and affected these relationships. You say it hadn't happened in my household, Father, Pastor. Well, good for you. But for a lot of us, it has. And so obey your parents in the Lord becomes the grace of God working in it. Or let's turn it around. What if, what if the, 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 the parents have, have experienced some things? What if some parents have had some rebellious children who, who told them that they hated them? Now, don't raise your hand or nod your head, but how many of us parents have been told that we're hated by our kids? All of us. <laughs> Maybe your house is not the same as mine. Or your children have done some things that have disappointed you. Maybe they've had babies or, or run off with knotheads or, 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 or some of those kinds of things. And you're thinking this, I've done the best I could. I was a good steward of that child. Again, that in the Lord becomes a place of grace. You see, because if God's given that child to you a gift, you don't love them because of their behavior. I, I, I like to think of it this way. Their value, the children's value, and the parents' value is not in what they do, but who they are. It's not in what they do. There's bad parenting. I got that. But your relationship with your child and your parent is based on who they are. That God's put you together. And, and what you've experienced as a child or what you've experienced as a parent, God's grace can cover over it. The Bible says it this way in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs strife, but love covers over. And I believe there's some children in our society that we need to cover them with some love in the Lord. Can you imagine teachers, parents, if love become greater and discipline because of love became greater in our society? The value is not in what they do, but in who they are in relationship to us. Not what I do but who you are. And I want to ask you this morning to bring that dynamic in the Lord into your family relationships. I want to ask you this morning to come and, and some parents and some grandparents, they need to be covered with love. And children, cover them with love. And there's some parents that got some children and they ain't clicking like you clicking. I want to ask you to bring the Lord into it. To cover them with love. See, the problem is we're trying to govern everybody else instead of allowing God to govern us. And when that happens in a family, 
There are things that can't be overcome only in the Lord. Only in His grace. Only His way. Not ours. Because families have flaws. But in the Lord is a phrase that begins to govern those relationships. I've got two pictures I want to share with you. I knew my time would be short today, so you're going to have to make your own application. The first picture is for the parent. When you're disappointed in your kid, when they've been free-spending, rebellious, and difficult, when they've moved to a far country, when they're living like you didn't teach them to live, I want to ask this attitude to be your heart. You listening? Say amen. This is a text of the prodigal son. And he, prodigal son, arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. The Bible says he felt compassion. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven. Notice the first thing is against heaven and against you and the Lord. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. And put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they begin to celebrate. May I say before you can have a celebration. There has to be a heart of a parent. To pray for that children in that far field. To understand. That your love. Is in the Lord. It's not in what they've done. To pray. To believe. That God's going to do something. To love when you're disappointed, when you're discouraged. Because you believe God's doing something. Now, parents, grandparents, I'm going to say something to you. It's not what they've done, it's who they are. They've been given by God. Now do it His way in the Lord. The prodigal is the picture. Keep praying. Keep believing in Him. For there's nothing impossible with God. Secondly, for you children, or some of you are not children anymore, you're adults, but you've been hurt. Your family's turned against you. The picture for you is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. It's a story of a young boy who had great dreams. And when he told his people about the dreams that he had, they made fun of him. And because God had his hand on him, they hated him. His brothers tried to kill him. He was sold into slavery to be seen no more, they thought. Can you imagine what it's like for kids that have been abandoned by their family? That that they have been estranged in such a way. I had a conversation with a a wonderful travel ball coach recently. And he talked about growing up in this area, but his mom had a crack problem. He talked about being 12 years old and having to fight grown men because they were trying to come in the windows at night. Now, most of us in here hadn't experienced that. But he understood this. What they meant for evil. God meant for good. And I see in this young man, somebody who was raised in the darkness, in the difficult places, and God had a plan for his life. And I don't know what you've experienced today, but I'm telling you something, God's got a plan for your life. I don't know what you've encountered or what, what's been a part of your life, but the Bible says it this way in Genesis chapter 20, 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In the Lord, they bow your parents. In the Lord. Isn't that good? Grace governs. 
You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. In other words, he let bygones be bygones. He didn't treat them as they deserved. He treated them as they did not deserve. He covered them with love. He conjured over them grace. It set him free from being angry and wounded all his life over what God had done and allowed in his life. And I want to tell you something. We need to be set free, church, from all that's happened in our past by the very grace of God that will cover and heal today. You say, Philip, you don't know what I've been through. No, friend, I don't. But he does. And he loves you. And he made you. Psalm 139. And he ordered your days before one of them came to be. And the Lord is the proper way to have a relationship with anybody. And the Lord. You see, Joseph began to see God in his dreams, in his development, and finally in his deliverance. Do you see God like that? Or have you taken the popular view? I read an article this week in the Wall Street Journal. It was March 17th. The article was about how we've left this book. Because professors and colleges and universities have said, that can't be true. There's no way that could happen. I'm going to tell you something, friend. I told you this last week, and I'm going to say it until I can't say it no more. We need to understand that this is true, whether we can understand it or not. I don't know when. If truth was about understanding, none of us would be able to fly. If you'll take this book and parent in the Lord. And if you'll cover with grace as a parent, you'll stand looking for those children that are in the far field and those grandchildren praying and believing. And as a grown child, if you'll let that go, what your parents did, I'm telling you something. Ain't none of them perfect. And you go to God and say, God, would you heal my heart? He'll do things that only He can do in your marriage, in your ministry, in your home. What's God saying to you this morning? First of all, I want to say that God loves you. And if you've never been born again, if you don't know what would happen to you today if you died, I'm going to ask you to come this morning. Jesus has made a way. That's all you're asking is, Mom and Dad, this question about a year ago. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Receive Him. As many as receive Him, to them He gave power to become children of God. Start there. I want to invite you this morning to come to Him. When I, when, as soon as this service is over, or this, uh, we, we start singing, I want to ask you to come to the front and, 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 and be saved. Ask God to save you this morning. Secondly, there's some of you in here this morning that need to be a part of this church family. God's had you here. He's led you here. You know He wants you to be here, and I'm going to ask you to come join this church. You say, I'm scared. Friend, uh, if you're going to walk with God, it's going to be scary. I'm going to ask you to do it by faith that He's called you. Thirdly, I believe there are people in a size, a crowd this size that need healing and renewal. You know exactly what that means. And I want to ask you to go to the Lord for that this morning. What is your reaction to God's word this morning? Will you stand? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we come before you this morning. Now, would you have your way in this special time of invitation and response? Would you work as only you can and for your glory? For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You sing and respond as God leads you. us today online. We're glad that you're here. We've cut away from our main service as our people respond to what
what God has said in song and sermon or perhaps even in a prayer. And we want to take the opportunity to offer you that same opportunity to respond. We believe that when God speaks in a worship service, that he speaks to not only the church, but to us individually. And perhaps God has spoken to you today, and I want to invite you to respond to him, to ask him, to speak to him, to confess your sin, to ask him to help you or to meet a need. Uh, responding to him is available to you personally, but we also want to make it available to you as a church, as a pastor. We want to reach out to you and make available to you uh, any services that we can provide for you uh, to meet a need physically, to encourage you, to pray with you. We welcome you to contact us. You're going to see our information on the screen in just a moment. And just please feel free to contact us. We want to connect with you. Even though you're in your home and we're here at the church, we are available. You are valuable. So in any way that we can serve you, please contact us. May God bless you as we continue to be about our Father's business.